Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Development Spatial Cell Mapping Asia and Australia panel session. I'm Muz Hanifa, and I'll be chairing this session. Well, we're using um, an interactive tool, Slido. So if you can either scan the QR code or actually go to the website there, slido.com forward slash HCA dev, uh, you'll be able to submit and vote for questions during this session. And in this, uh, and within Slido, you can submit a question anytime um, and you can find the Q&A tab shown here in the red circle uh, and you know, feel free to submit your questions at that, um, through there. And the questions with the most votes will be prioritized. You'll also be able to kind of share your ideas and resources. And there is a, a tab called Ideas, which is circled in red here again. And please feel free to share any resources or subject-related um, references uh, on spatial genomics uh, under this tab. And we very much like you to participate. We want to hear from you. We've got polls. And if you go to the polls tab, uh, we've got a few questions. And it would be great if you can actually answer those questions. And we'll show you the live poll here over the next 20 seconds. So the first answer we've got about what would you like to get out of this panel is good morning from Cincinnati. <laughs> Brilliant. And the, and the next question we had was, how did you hear about this panel? And the vast majority of you, 63%, have responded uh, direct email as how you heard about this. In fact, it's now gone to 67%, uh, with 11% effectively or 10% for social media and the HCA website. So we've got people wanting information and direct mail being the most um, effective way of reaching out to you. So please do um, go to the poll tab and you know, fill out the poll whenever you can. And also don't forget to submit your questions under the Q&A tab. I'm your session host uh, and assisting me today is Bruce Arano, um, while Gary Bader is deep in the Canadian woods. Our guest speakers today are Max Nilsson, Ali Ertuk and Hiroki Ueda. We have an excellent list of panelists um, which include Linda Richards, Alan Shadotal, Bruce Arano, uh, and our speakers, Mats Nilsson, Ali Ertuk, and Hiroki Ueda. So our first speaker uh, is Mats Nilsson, uh, and we want you to take a poll. If you go to the um, Slido, you can actually take a guess on who you think is uh, Mats. Uh, there are several options for you. I'll give a clue. A lab-based background might be helpful. Matt uh, doesn't need any introduction. He's the SciLife Lab. Um, he's based in SciLife Lab, where he's the site director uh, of SciLife Lab in Stockholm. Uh, trained in Sweden and the Netherlands, and he has uh, spent many years working on technology development in molecular analysis. Uh, and once we've done this poll, uh, we will basically be able to go to his talk. Brilliant, and let's see what, okay. So, now Matt's. It was number four. Number four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. So thanks for the introduction, and I'll just uh, very briefly summarize uh, the, the seminar I go. Oh, so it will be without any explanation, just, just the, the so yeah, and uh, <clears throat> so the method use um, is a targeted approach to profile um, sets of genes um, that we find uh, relevant to analyze in in um, all the. Uh, we use uh, this padlock probe RCA based approach where we target the uh, um, sets of, um, of transcripts by uh, recognizing probe molecules that become amplified by RCA. We generate very bright detection signals in situ, which um, makes it possible to screen with low magnification objective wide field imaging. 
file hundreds of genes in parallel in. Uh, so uh, one thing I uh, presented was the, 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 our contribution to a, a recent work from Stian Linnartan's group on uh, studying the mouse brain development. Um, so it has done close to 300,000 cells in uh, different stages of, of the mouse brain development and uh, they generated this uh, first atlas of in development with different continents of cell types uh, emerging. Uh, so what we did there was targeting 119, should be 119, 119 ligands, receptors, and transcript factors um, that uh, were predicted to be um, uh, active in, in the organizer of uh, that we could Part, uh, or to define 40 different local environments, different environments for, for cellular bionic stage A10. Uh, another aspect of what we're doing is the probabilistic cell mapping. So we we um, objective here is to go from cell clusters. Uh, from seeing cell RNA sequencing and map these cell clusters onto tissue sections. And how we do that is selecting uh, marker genes for the different clusters, uh, develop assays, um, profile them in situ, assign uh, gene reads to individual cells, and then uh, match these cell compositions to the RNA sequencing fashion and place every cell in the tissue or give it a probability of belonging to a certain cell. And we validate test, uh, develop that and validate it in mouse brain. Um, um, spatial cell atlases of, uh, of molecular defined, defined cell types. This is something we have applied in uh, human developmental heart tissue um, in, in collaboration with the um, group um, where we mapped, um, made spatial cell maps over this probabilistic approach for uh, uh, ages of my, um, human. Um, art development, uh, and where we took spatial transcriptomic data, the, the transcriptome wide version, the Visium version, um, took markers from that and from single cell RNA sequencing, and uh, generated a spatial uh, cell atlas of uh, uh, all cell RNA sequencing defined cell types. Yeah, that's, that was my presentation in a short format. Many thanks, Matt. Uh, we will have all the questions um, at the panel discussion at the end. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that the two talks by Matt and um, Ali were available uh, for viewing. And we wanted a short summary on this occasion uh, for um, our session today. Our next speaker is Ali Ertuk, who's an inventor and artist and currently the director of Helmholtz Institute in Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine, ITEM in Munich, uh, where he's been the director since July 2019. And he has also worked a lot on tissue clearing, uh, and you can see some of his uh, miraculous achievements in the lab in this little video clip here. So over to you, Ali, uh, to summarize your previous talk. Yeah, so on, uh, during my free times, I also do um, I run a kebab shop. shop. So, um, well, um, as you know, we are an organism of interconnected systems. Um, from head to toe, we are wired with nerves, muscles, and other system. Clearly, this is affecting one part of our body will affect the rest. Therefore, ideally, we should really study diseases at whole body scale. However, there hasn't been really, at least in terms of imaging tools, not successful ones that we can see the cellular details. Very simply, we are familiar with standard histology where we do sectioning of tissue stain and look at the slices, which is most of the time good, but if you want to study really systems biology, complicated structures of nerves and cells and treated that is not sufficient, clearly looking at fragments will not give us a lot of information. To overcome this, and we and others have been developing so-called optical tissue clearing technologies to convert opaque 
biology constitution to transplant structure. We can take this converting milk into water. Now we can see through and scan through to obtain cellular details. When I started my lab, we initially applied this technology to make whole mouse bodies transparent. On the lower bottom left, you see the green mouse where we could transform the whole mouse body transparent, but also scan at that time with light sheet microscopy at the um, uh, high resolution, close to cellular details. Later, we improved this um, technology by amplifying the signal coming from nerves. So the one in the middle you see is actually the same animal, the same transgenic where we can see now much more of the nerves because of the enhancements of the signal. And then uh, after getting this high level of uh, quality through skin and bones, imaging with laser microscopy after tissue cleaning, we could also use this technology to map cancer metastasis and drug targeting in cell, uh, in whole mouse bodies, as you see on the uh, most right one. So, of course, uh, imaging whole organs, whole mouse bodies generate a lot of uh, data that would require um, uh, high quality analysis. And for that, we use machine learning because it's unbiased, scalable, and has really high performance, exceeding most uh, clearly also in terms of output to human um, performance. So just um, to give you one example, we recently uh, published uh, uh, mapping of the whole mouse brain musculature down to capillary level by using tissue transparency and deep learning. So in the interest of, of course, this symposium, I want to show you a little bit of about human mapping um, because um, that is most relevant here. And when we started um, clearing of human organs, it didn't work well. Actually, our, our method and some others that we tried, there was a problem and Sean solved this problem. The problem was that the standard um, detergents used for tissue permeabilization, SDS and Triton, were not able to make human organs um, um, uh, permeabilize because they would get stuck on the surface. They are these large micellar size. We screen and identify chops, which you could see have the smaller micellar size, could um, permeabilize the stiff top of the tissue, and then all the clearing and labeling solutions could get in. Doing that, we could, for example, make the whole human eye fully transparent and look at the cellular details, retina, iris, but also in the behind of the eye, you would see details of the nerves and the immune cells around. Again, we use deep learning to quantify such large human tissue, tissues, uh, image here around here in the developing algorithm that we could, for example, simply segment and quantify hundreds and millions, even billions of cells in human brain. So what are the applications of human organ clearing? Simply, uh, we could really, we have now a new way to study diseases at a whole human organ scale. For example, here, a whole human the human kidney rendered transparent and then scanned with light microscopy. You can see here capillaries shown in green and glomeruli in magenta and cyan show some of the collagen and uh, mid-sized vessels. If we zoom in, we see on the right-hand side, there are some regions lacking some of the radial structures. In particular, this uh, capillaries labeled by green, you, are, you see that they're missing the large ones that there. If we look at also the um, magenta channel, the glomeruli also they are not there. On the left hand side, they are mostly there. And we see also, for example, cyan color, which is showing the autofluorescence distributed throughout the whole sec, um, tissue that is, in a way, proving that it is not an imaging artifact because we see cyan labeling throughout the whole tissue. And um, so we also would like to use this technology to help mapping human brain. As you know, this is an important project, but it is quite difficult because it's so large. Now making whole human organ trust, uh, human brain transparent, we have at least a way to see the cells in the intact setting. And we would like to also use human mapping, human organ mapping for 3D bioprinting technologies, because as you know, 3D Printing means 3D copying something in, in space. If we want to copy human organs, we would need cellular matters of human organs at least cellular resolution. And we can generate uh, potentially these maps using this channel technology 
and then in some future, near future, hopefully we could start generating large scale human tissues and organs. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, our next speaker um, is Hiroki Ueda, who trained in the University of Tokyo and is now based in the Laboratory of Systems Biology Riken Center for Biosystems Dynamic Research. Hiroki has also pioneered tissue clearing and imaging methods, um, including the cubic system. I'm looking forward to your talk now, Hiroki. Spazza. Uh Okay, let me share my screen. So, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, my name is Hiro Gueda. Uh, please just call me Hiro. Uh, and, and today, uh, I briefly introduce uh, tissue clearing, hydrophilic uh, tissue clearing technique called Cubic, C-U-B-I-C. So, by using this kind of technique, you can make a, how to say, single cell resolution, three-dimensional address of uh, mice, maybe a rat, and a uh, probably human brain. Okay. So uh, let me begin with the uh, uh, kind of a state of the art. Uh, so uh, uh, just two years ago, uh, so we succeeded to perform the whole brain profiling of the ev every single cell existing in the adult mice brain, which is about 10, uh, sorry, uh, so 100 million cells existing in the uh, mice, adult brains. Then just recently, a couple of uh, months ago, we succeeded to perform whole body profiling of uh, every single cell existing in the newborn mice, which is about 428 million cells. So by using you know, tissue clearing together with the uh, light sheet microscopy technique uh, pointed here, you can access to that uh, kind of a cell address in mammals, uh, hopefully in human. Okay. So uh, for beginners, uh, so I and uh, uh, Elaine and also Ali uh, with other uh, tissue clearing uh, expert, we wrote the review paper recently published in Nature Review Neuroscience. And also I wrote the uh, review paper on the ice sheet microscopy especially on the whole uh, organ profiling of the cell and circuit in neurons. So please check it out. So you may know, you, you, many of you are familiar with the physics of the tissue clearing, but I briefly introduce uh, some physical principles, okay? So because within the cell, there are many substances like uh, waters and also lipid and the proteins, okay? And then property of light in the, each substances are completely different, okay? So for example, in the water, refractive indices is about 1.33. And then in lipid, uh, it's about 1.45 or something. And then protein, uh, refractive indices is about uh, 1.54, uh, so which are completely different. So therefore, we remove the lipid, and then we exchange the water with other high ROI uh, medium or uh, by doing that, we reduce the uh, light scattering. Uh, and also, there are many pigments in the uh, cell, so we uh, elute the uh, pigment from the organs. By doing that, we can uh, uh, achieve the uh, tissue clearing. Okay. And then there are three major uh, methods. Okay. So as Ali explained nicely, a uh, hydrophobic reagent can be used for tissue clearing. Okay, which has a almost 100 years uh, history. Okay? And, and also hydrophilic reagent can be also used for the tissue clearing, which is initiated by the uh, Putin in Russia. Okay? And the third method is hydrogel, hydrogel based method. Okay? And then there are pros and cons among three uh, uh, tissue clearing technique. But we are focusing on the hydrophilic reagent technique because it's a uh, 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 has high, it has a high safety, and also it can preserve the uh, uh, fluorescence nicely. But you know, all, one of the problem in hydrophilic uh, tissue clearing technique was, uh, you know, performance is relatively low. So therefore, we perform the uh, how to say uh, chemical screening. Um, strategy approach to identify the uh, high, highly potent uh, uh, reagent. Okay, 
So we smash the brain and then to make a brain paste. And then by using brain paste, we screen the uh, chemicals. And then we found I mean, alcohol seems to have a high potent capability to remove the lipid. And then we apply them into the uh, uh, adult mice brain to make a mice brain transparent. And accidentally, uh, this I amino mean, alcohol also eluded the him from the red blood cell. So therefore, we apply them to the uh, 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 entire mice uh, bodies. Okay? And then it started, and at that time, we speculated uh, amino alcohol, nitrogen, compete with the interaction between hem and the hemoglobin through the histogen and competing with each other. Uh, and then we recently confirmed this is a mechanism uh, in which uh, some potent uh, decolorizing reagent can elute the hem. And then in combined with the uh, uh, combination with the uh, light sheet microscopy, we can get uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, structures in rapid way, and then we can access the, uh, for example, heart, lung, uh, let's say liver and kidneys data. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but uh, in at present, you know, physics of tissue clearing is well established, but uh, in um, regarding on the how to say chemistry. We still don't know the exact underlying mechanism. For example, decolorization is possible, but but, um, but we don't know the exact mechanism. And then delipidation is possible, but we don't know the exact mechanism. And then decalcification is also key uh, for the whole body clearing, but uh, it it is premature. And also ally matching uh, is key, but uh, we don't know the exact uh, chemical structure, which is uh, Potent for the uh, ally matching. And the expansion sometimes contribute to the uh, tissue clearing, but we don't know the exact mechanism. Okay? So, therefore, we perform the chemical profiling of one, more than 1,600 chemicals, and then we establish five different assay systems to evaluate the elementary process of tissue clearing. Including delipidation, decolorization, decalcification, expansion, and ally matching. And we found state of the art the hydrophilic reagent, and also we found chemical structure related to that in each uh, chemical process. Okay. So by using this technique, we can uh, visualize uh, cancer metastasis, as Ali mentioned. In 2017, we apply them to the uh, 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 cancer metastasis. Okay. And also, same technique can be applied not only rodent, but also human, uh, for example, clinical sample. So in collaboration with the pathologist, we succeeded to apply this technique to the uh, 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 diagnosis of the uh, cancer metastasis. And then uh, uh, this technique can be also applied to the entire uh, how to say, primate and also human uh, sample. Okay? And as Ari mentioned, uh, so we, uh, our technique uh, can be applicable to the uh, uh, human organ. So within the audience, if you have a, how to say, if you ha have a, how to say, uh, motivation to be a transparent human, please contact me through Slido. Okay? So you are my, how to say, uh, how to say, uh, subject, okay. Okay, so after we published a paper, uh, some uh, tissue clearing uh, uh, chemical company already uh, start selling our reagent to the uh, to the world, and then after that, there are many applications, unexpected applications, I would say. One of the application was uh, uh, some uh, researcher in Japan apply our technology uh, to the pill bags and then to make a transparent pill bag and also make a, a transparent crab. Some high school students also apply our technique to the drone beetle, horn beetle, and the stag beetle to make a transparent insect. Okay. So by using technique, uh, you can analyze every, maybe every single cell existing in these beetles. Okay. So, oh, and then as I said, uh, bone clearing was a, a kind of a, uh, challenge previously, but uh, recently we, after we screened the uh, 1,600 chemical, we found some 
reagent, uh, like a imidazole, have a potent property to reduce uh, the hydroxy appetite and in, in combination with the uh, uh, EDTA. And then by using that, we can, how to say, uh, clear the uh, bone to visualize uh, bone metastasis. And also after uh, uh, screening, we also found that very potent chemical, which can edutahim, which can really mimicking the histogen, uh, which is important for the interaction uh, with him, meaning these mechanism would be an underlying mechanism for the uh, uh, him uh, uh, decalizations. So, and also in terms of the expansion, we found some chemical have a property to expand the uh, uh, organ. And then uh, by using that, uh, we, uh, how to say, uh, try to visualize the, every single cell existing in the mice brain. Uh, this is kind of an expansion microscopy uh, strategy, which is proposed by the uh, Ed Boyden in 2015. But in this case, we don't use exogenous hydrogel, but we only use uh, hydrophilic reagent. So you, meaning this technique is quite robust. You can just dip them into the uh, reagent and then wait a couple of days. Okay. So, and then we can um, um, build the light sheet microscopy specialized for the, uh, for the uh, expanded brain. And then we try to look at the every single cell existing in the uh, mice brain, and at which turn out to be uh, 100 million cells. So based on that, uh, we now making a how to say address, okay? and also uh, during that time, we also found uh, actually our organ reversibly expand and also shrink, meaning our organ itself is kind of a polymer gels. Okay, so to confirm this, so we try to change the environmental condition of the brain. And then we confirm uh, brain and reversibly expand the shrink and the reversibly expand the shrink, okay? which is consistent with the uh, previous idea proposed by Toyoichi Tanaka. And they, he proposed a biological organ uh, behave like gels. Okay? So if this is true, we can, how to say, uh, uh, use the very old uh, equation uh, describing the refractive indices of the polymers. And then in this case, we can, how to say, uh, characterize the uh, 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 tissue refractive indices by using monomer, I mean, unit refractive indices. And then elipidation, decalification, expansion may contribute to the monomer refractive indices or monomer volume. And then composite uh, organ refractive indices uh, should be matched with the uh, uh, refractive indices of the medium. And then in addition to the light scattering part, we can reduce the pigment okay, by uh, reducing the uh, light absorptions. And then each uh, elementary process uh, can be achieved by the chem uh, special chemical structures. So if you're interested in, we how to say, describe these detail in the review and then please check it out. So it seems like a chemical foundation is gradually uh, formed. So therefore we think it's high time to move forward to the applications. So therefore oh, we made a, a single cell address of brain based on the whole brain profiling of the cells. And then we are thinking this kind of address, I mean, uh, cell address, can uh, work as a kind of a human genome or mouse genome, which can be mapped uh, by the other uh, sequences. Okay, so in this case, uh, uh, kind of a uh, brain address or organ address can be mapped by the uh, immunostain data or in situ data, like uh, cell in, uh, describing cell uh, type and activity and the connections. Okay, so uh, to do that, we also developed a new tissue staining technique called cubic HB, uh, which is just published in Nature uh, Communication 2020. And then by using this technique, we can, uh, how to say, stain uh, 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 any cells. 
and also for these reagent, I mean kit, are commercially available now. And then after staining, sorry, after staining, uh, so we can analyze the uh, data by using the cloud-based uh, technique. And then we recently uh, developed the interactive whole brain viewer of uh, these data. And then you can analyze PV data and somatostatin data and chat or uh, TH data, C4 uh, after uh, NMDA receptor uh, administration or Lady's virus data, which characterize the connections. And then cubic address, I mean, cubic cloud software is. Uh, will be released on August uh, 11th, maybe 10 or 11 days later. So or, or you can view the individual data uh, by yourself. So please check it out. Okay. All right. So or, or in the remaining maybe months, uh, so how many minutes do I have? Five minutes? Yes, you have time. Um, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so I would say there are three future directions. So first one would be uh, going to be faster. So a previous, uh, how to say, light sheet microscopy, it takes us three hours to characterize low resolution data, but it can be down to the uh, five minutes. Uh, and also uh, high resolution data, it took uh, uh, three days, but it can be down to the four hours by using, uh, how to say, high-speed light sheet microscopy. And then another uh, direction will be a smaller. So uh, currently, uh, X5 resolution is quite high enough, but uh, uh, axial resolution is not so good. So uh, by using uh, axial sweep technique, uh, we can achieve, uh, uh, how to say, uh, high resolutions. So, and then this technique can be combined with the expansion microscopy technique. We can uh, uh, achieve, the, uh, how to say, quite good uh, resolution of the day. Okay. And then by using this technique, we can, we are planning to perform the whole brain synapsis analysis in adult mice brain. And then interestingly, it's give rise petabyte data. So we call this project as a petascope project. Okay. And the final uh, direction would be a bigger. Okay. So uh, as I said in the beginning of my talk, uh, we recently succeeded to uh, perform the whole body profiling of every single cell in the uh, piezo mice, newborn mice. So uh, then this is possible. Uh, and then same thing would be possible for the uh, adult mice body or maybe even primate bodies. Okay. For example, in mom's head, so we recently succeeded to uh, clear the entire mom's head. We are the bone, we are the, uh, how to say, internal organ. Uh, only remaining thing is the eye, but it can be cleared uh, by using uh, other breaching uh, chemical. So maybe whole body uh, profiling of uh, primate may be possible. And also whole, br whole brain profiling of every single cell of adult mom set would be possible uh, by uh, using, uh, how to say, cutting edge technique. Uh, we are now uh, preparing for that. So in near future, we can, how to say, characterize every single cell using the primate brain. And then staining is also possible for the uh, mom set brain. Uh, so by using staining, our current staining technique. So uh, we can expect application of this technique to the uh, 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 adult, uh, at least hemisphere of the mouse brain. So in near future, as Ali said, we are also planning to move forward to the human brain. But a human brain is so big, so uh, it's about uh, 2,000 fold of the uh, uh, adult mice. And then it's contained 200 billion cells. So, and then we 
try to, how to say, we have to speed it up the light sheet microscopy, and also we have to achieve, we have to, how to say, uh, version up. Uh, uh, we have to improve the potency of the issue clearing. So we are in the middle of the process, but uh, in the future, we would like to achieve this and that we can contribute. We would like to contribute to the human um, brain cell atlas project. Okay. So by that, uh, I'd like to, uh, how to say, end my talk. And also I'd like to thank, uh, how to say, our collaborator. Uh, this is a kind of a, a, a international and also interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. And then uh, by that, I'll end my talk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hiroki, for the um, fantastic talk. It's really good to sort of um, hear of the uh, scale and potential of these applications. Uh, what we normally do uh, with these sessions is to have like a discussion where the speakers and a few other members form a, a panel, and then we have the questions from the audience uh, in Slido that we um, ask the panel members. So we have two panel members in addition to our three speakers. Um, and um, it'd be great if I can have Linda Richards um, and Alan Shadatal to introduce themselves. Linda, would you be happy to go first, please? Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Linda Richards. I'm from the Queensland Brain Institute in Brisbane, Australia. I'm a developmental neurobiologist and I specialize in um, development of the um, connections of the cerebral cortex, in particular the corpus callosum. And uh, I work on human um, developmental brain disorders as well. And uh, I'm a spokesperson for the International Brain Initiative, as well as a co-chair for the Australian Brain Alliance. Thank you. Alain, would you like to introduce yourself? So, yeah, so hello everyone. So I'm Alain Chetotal, currently on vacation, as you can tell. So I normally work in Paris on uh, trying to use like tissue clearing method to study brain uh, connectivity in mice and also to apply the technology to study uh, human embryology uh, using uh, clearing. Thank you. Um, and I have Bruce who's um, busy fielding the questions. So please send in the questions through Slido. And um, we'll start with the discussion panel now. And we've got the first question. Uh, please describe the process and the importance of marker selection. Should it be biased for functional roles or rank in cell type specific expression or spatial localization? So I'm going to first direct this question to Matt and then open it up to others uh, on the panel. Yeah, so I, uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, the, I guess the, the easy answer to that is, uh, is what you want to get out of the spatial map. Um, but I would say that all these three aspects are, are important. Um, qualities of, of markers for, 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 for spatial uh, cell atlases for uh, clearly, you would like to have um, marker uh, high specificity with your markers. It's good uh, to, to be able to give it for your cell types. Uh, but you would probably also like to have a little bit of an insight into function, you know, the, the functional relevant activities of of, uh, of cells of a certain type. Um, and um, now, Typically, so maybe the, the spatial uh, specificity may not be so uh, important because you sort of get it out of the experiment anyway. You get space and you, you don't really have the aspect in your uh, model. It could be good though for more like quality uh, experiments to have a set of video specific uh, marker genes that. In a smaller scale experiment, or you know, between your samples, uh, your samples are good, and you're you're uh, any generation. Not having to to uh, profile all genes, but that's um, 
I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a completely needed aspect. So I'm going to ask, um, maybe Linda could chime in because let's bring in the idea that, you know, you're, you're working on the brain development and maybe some of the cells are actually not really known in terms of like what are the markers. So what do you think in terms of the balance of, you know, not having information about what the cells are and trying to kind of like uh, incorporate or, or try to kind of get the maximum amount of information? So I think you can get a lot of information from the morphology of the cells and um, also their, their connectivity. So I was pretty excited to hear that Hero is doing a, a synapse map of the, of the brain and um, I think it's going to be amazing if you can uh, compare the, the full morphology of the cells. So here I guess is where you would want some um, where the markers would really come into their own because you'd want to be able to label the synapses but also have some kind of uh, variegated whole cell feel. Maybe Hero can um, comment on how you're going to do that. Yeah, so so how to say, so there are two directions. In terms of the tissue clearing and whole brain profiling, so there are two directions. So one is, as I mentioned, you know, Focusing on the synapses, it's like a how to say, how to say, uh, kind of a small entity, but it's quite uh, can be separated. I mean, segmented. So therefore, you can perform the whole brain profiling. Okay? But you know, in that analysis, we use uh, you know each cell, how to say, properties. Okay. So therefore, you know, there are two second directions. So in which you can focus on the particular type of cells and neurons, and then try to look at the uh, entire morphology of the uh, cells, I mean, neurons. And then which this type of ap approach can be already published in the Mice Light project by Genelia Farm. And then, so they uh, performed the 1,000 uh, cells characterization, and then in which they First, use uh, uh, how to say serial sectioning technique, but uh, they are moving forward to the uh, light sheet microscopy together with the uh, tissue clearing. So to speed it up, so there are uh, uh, two direction uh, um, at the moment. But uh, you know, of course, you know we can achieve both <laughs> in same analysis. But uh, this is this is a little bit tough at the moment. It sounds like um, other modalities like morphology and you know connectivity uh, also play a role, uh, but that's in the brain context. But what about the other organs, for example? I think you know maybe Ali or Alan might want to comment on how you would kind of like uh, decide on markers, and perhaps this brings into one of the next question, which is you know how does the suspension single cell transcriptome data benefit spatial methods, uh, genomics, or, or, or microscopy? So um, would Ali or Alan like to go first? I'll make it easier. Alan, uh, uh, yeah, no, no, no. But the, so it's also back to what Linda was saying, and maybe Matt and and Hiro can answer. So Hiro, you show nicely, like okay, you can visualize TH projection because there's an antibody specific for a certain population or CAT for a specific cholinergic population. Um, but like I think Matt, when you did like a special comic on a, on a mouse brain, can you identify like a marker for which we could develop an antibody that will label a specific track? They say you want to study prefrontal connection uh, to some part of the brain or amygdala projection. Do you think we're going to find, uh, based on what you've done, for instance, a marker that will be specific for a specific subset, or we're going to have like a a bunch of shared marker for neurons, and it will be very difficult in human, but in particular to isolate a specific tract based on the expression of a specific protein. And the same for other organs. Sometimes it might be you might have like a, a nice like antibody for a single protein that will be in a specific cell types. But uh, do you think based on that you can combine the two technologies, like identify like key markers in special comics, and then try to develop antibodies? So. I don't know if it's clear, but uh, something around that. Any um, feedback from Ali? 
Um, I guess at the moment what we can do is uh, like uh, Alan said and what Hero and others have been doing, multi round labeling of the brain with specific antibodies. There's a clearly a targeted approach. It's not going to be like we are going to do it uh, singles. You know, we cannot do whole brain singles. Trans trans it would be great, but I, I don't see this as very nearby. A major problem there, I think, has to be sorted by experts. How do you barcode? the cells that you image in 3D space, there is a hero show, there is 100 million cells in mouse brain. How do you barcode each of them? When you make for a suspension smoothie for transcriptomics, how do you go back? That I couldn't find an answer. Um, one could think of um, maybe multi ron fish kind of labeling, but again, then fish probes are very small. You cannot image them in whole mouse. You know, if you do fish labeling, this time at the whole brain scale, you won't see it. It's not like slides. You're looking one centimeter deep into tissue to see mRNA signal will be almost cost impossible uh, uh, reliably in multi-run labeling. So we need some out of the box thinking here. I guess it's a good challenge for everyone. <laughs> Can I try and ask a, a question? I think that summarizes um, several of the, the questions from our previous session and, and sort of rattles around my mind now after. Listening to this, let's say let's say we're going to look for somatostatin neurons in their different anatomical contexts. So there's a lot of different somatostatin positive subtypes in, that we get from basic single cell transcriptomic data. But then when we try and think about those in the spatial context, what's the the process to to figure out what subtypes of those neurons are present in different anatomical locations? What, what's the process with respect to um, both co-situating them with other neurons, um, let alone the synaptic transmission? And then just in the subtype markers, identifying where somatostatin subtype cells are localized in different um, nuclear contexts, let's say in different anatomical what is the, How would that whole process work? So somatostatin neuron uh, is about 0.5% of the entire brain, meaning probably 1% of the entire neuron. So, and then you can, how to say, visualize on the, or quantify the morphology or, how to say, intensity of the somatostatin in, in individual cells. And then if the uh, number or maybe intensity of the somatostatin are differed from different, how to say, uh, experiment condition, we can focusing on that particular uh, anatomical location in which some change or some uh, physiological related change might occur. But otherwise, it's very difficult. So, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, we, I have a dream uh, in which we can quantify every single, how to say, expression every single cell's expression data in the, at least uh, mice brain, which contain 100 million cells, which is way, how to say, much more than the current, uh, currently uh, uh, performable, uh, how to say, number of the single cell analysis. But uh, in the future, so we can compare the side by side, uh, you know, on the right hand side, you can, you have a, a whole brain, you know, spatial data. On the left hand side, you have a, you know, a single cell expression data. And then you can uh, 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 compare these, you know, all data one by one. But, you know, you need to, at least, you know, single cell sequencing technique should be at least in terms of the throughput, it should be improved more. Thank you. So, yeah, I have some comments. Uh, I think that uh, one would really need a multi-technology approach to try to, to uh, put all pieces together. I, I don't think it maybe will be feasible to do a whole human, say, human brain imaging experiment where you have all the con connections, all the connectivity, and all the molecular information, uh, and you know all the uh, spatial uh, details. I think one, one needs to, to think about approaches where one can uh, subset samples, um, pieces of, of whole 
for example, a whole image uh, organ, then strategically um, drill holes or something, to take cores out of it or veins, sections, and do more molecular uh, deep profiling of it and try to really get the perfect one-to-one -one alignment of, of the different data sets. And, and in, in these uh, molecular data sets, we would need both protein level analysis and, and the mRNA uh, level analysis. And, and the mRNA to link it to single cell RNA sequence. And the proteins uh, may be more to morphology. And um, for example, with, with the mRNA, I think it would be very hard. I think it, most of it, is uh, is located in in cell bodies of the brain, um, so that's where you will find your mRNA information. You won't find it in your dendrites or exons or in the synapses with very little information from the mRNA. That you really have to base it on on the imaging or proteins. Uh, but you would like probably to be able to you know link all these kind, kind, uh, levels of of uh, and and different data formats. And there again, uh, as uh, uh, I think you're a vision hero of, of uh, having, uh, you know, a um, genome database. Uh, but here we have sort of a cell loam, the cell, uh, you know, the exact cell position or, or architecture of, uh, of, of organs in a, in a browsable and a blastable fashion. It'd be fantastic. Um, but then I'm not really sure. And, and that, that I think that may work in development. Uh, I think then maybe we'll have a lot of, you know, stereotyped uh, um, form and shape pattern of, of organs, but as um, they have long lives. And I think our organs uh, change, change shape and, uh, and, and become more individualized. In, in, um, in a sense, I don't think maybe that would be so easy to exactly align images of organs from different individuals. Uh, so, adults. Thanks, Mats. I mean, whilst you're here, because you kind of touched on it, it might be easier to ask the next question, which is, how does the suspension single cell transcriptome data benefit spatial genomics? Um, I, I guess... I think that's almost the first the, the first question after you have re, re, generated your single cell data sets where, where you have defined your you know, your molecular cell types uh, having certain molecular you know consistent molecular profiles. Next question is is really how are they organized? I think spatially you would really like to see that. Who, who are the neighbors? In what context do those cells exist? Uh, so I think that's um, um, they go very well uh, hand in you know hand in hand. Like they are perfectly complementary and and needed. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to actually remind people who are attending the seminar to please vote um, on the questions uh, so that we can actually um, help rank them and also do submit your questions. Um, the next question. Uh, that has been highlighted is, can the panel describe in more detail the advantages and disadvantages of the different tissue clearing methods? Uh, for example, hydrophobic and hydrophilic methods. Uh, perhaps uh, you could start um, with, with this question. I, I, <clears throat> I mean, I oh. voted, I think this would be here, can answer this. No, 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 go for it, Ali, yeah, go on. Um, well, in general, I mean, there is really three categories for now, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and hydrogel-based. The hydrophobic ones that we use in general, this line of clearing, use organic solvents. They're very fast. They provide the highest transparency. They're, um, they can therefore apply larger and larger organs relatively easier. They, they're major maybe drawback is that um, the um, endogenous for some proteins, there's like EGFT and so on, can quench relatively fast because hydrophobic means you remove the water, but to see GFP and RFP, this kind of flow somewhere, you need some water in the environment. 
So there you have to show that by labeling it with antibodies against GFP, RFP, which we did actually in weed disco technology, then it's stable forever. Um, on the other side, of course, organic solutions are not the nicest chemicals to work with it. Uh, so you have to be more careful, use the hoods and so on. Um, I draw, um, Hydrophilic ones, I think uh, Hero can say, and uh, also hydro, uh, hydrogel based work. Uh, every time I, how to say, oh, you know, Ali and then uh, other, how to say, hydrogel based uh, uh, expert, like uh, uh, Casey uh, in MIT, um, you know, sometimes in the same meeting, and we are always fighting with each other. I'm I'm joking, but uh, but uh, you know, oh, interestingly, you know, each technique, uh, how to say, become interacting with each others. For example, our reagent sometimes used in the hydro hydrophobic uh, technique, sometimes in hydrogel based technique, and um, for and also we sometimes use hydrogel based technique for fixations, and then also how to say we we have a how to say. We got the idea uh, from the hydrophobic uh, uh, method. So, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, choosing the uh, uh, you know, right uh, tissue clearing method is a little bit tricky. Uh, but uh, you know, sometimes it depends on the uh, choice. Maybe depend on the purpose. Okay. For if you are interested in the how to say. Perfect preservation of the uh, fluorescence. Maybe hydrophilic reagent might be a, a, a first choice. Uh, and if you're interested in the fixation, uh, you know, hydrogel based uh, technique would be the first choice. And if you're interested in the uh, high performance, maybe hydrophobic reagent would be the first choice. So it depends on the uh, purpose of your. Okay, well, that's really helpful. Um, any other contributions, Alan or Linda? Would you like to say anything on this? I mean, from if you saw movies from uh, Iro for Ali, if you don't know which technique was used, you cannot tell. Okay, they're just nice, beautiful, etc. So, it, which means that both techniques they work fine. What you need is to have someone in your lab who's willing to spend time developing the technology. And for some reason, they might prefer one or the other. You see what Ali and I are using. Some labs they find it too toxic, which might be true or not. So they would rather uh, use the water-based solution. It really depends. If, but I mean, clearly, again, from seeing all the technology, they work well. well. Uh, it might depend again on uh, the time. Also, if you want to do the the type of, the type of processing you do for the immunostaining, for instance, so is different, as we discussed before. Like we do the immunostaining before we do the clearing, so then we know that most antigens they work fine. They are preserved. Other technique uh, that will be cleared before you do the staining, they will, will kind of maybe like uh, destroy some antigens, so they will be not as good for immunostaining. But you need, I mean, you, you need to choose one. I mean, I would say between Cubic, uh, iDisco, and Clarity, we have three you can start with, and then it's just a matter of uh, what you prefer, and you, you have to try on something. But try on something simple. Don't start with adult human brain. Okay? Start with like a tiny mouse embryo brain, and if you cannot clear it, it doesn't work. So try with something easy, simple staining, uh, and, then, and then you will see. But you need someone in your lab that will be uh, committed. But that's the clearing, that will be related to one of the questions. That's not the uh, the most complex part of the process. It's more like the analysis behind uh, what what will be left after your tissue is cleared. That's where the big problem is uh, at the moment, I think. Okay. No, that's in, really in order to um, achieve the the highest resolution view, let's say we want to really establish cell cell um, adjacency relationships, or let let's say an extracellular matrix to a, to a cell. Um, Surface, is there a, a still a special role for expansion um, based methods to um, to to bring out that super resolution, or do you guys see the 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 super resolution microscopy is getting towards being able to do that without any art? How much artifact is there of the expansion? Okay, so expansion microscopy is interesting, and we also developed a hydrophilic reagent-based expansion microscopy. The one problem in expansion microscopy is you need a good lens with a larger, longer working distances because, because it's expand. 
And then usually it's, you know, there are no such lens sometimes. So therefore, you know, or uh, if you have a, how to say, a good physicist uh, in your lab uh, who can design the good lens, uh, you know, I recommend, uh, how to say, expansion microscopy. And then we are lucky, we are collaborating with a uh, uh, Japanese microscopy company to develop the such lens. So therefore, we prefer uh, expanded microscopy. And then uh, super, resolution, super resolution technique is not, uh, how, to say, uh, how to say, can be combined with uh, uh, expanded microscopy. So therefore, you know, uh, it depends on the, your purpose. You know, if you really want to uh, untangle the cell-cell uh, contact uh, uh, with, with the, uh, how to say, wider uh, size, Maybe you usually combine both. Great. Um, that's fantastic. Matt, sorry, Matt, can, I, can, I, can I one question for Matt, which is kind of related is, Matt, in terms of size of what you can do in special transitomics now, so we are talking like now, you know, you can do mouse brain for clearing, it's easy, etc. Human might be difficult. On your side, because I'm not a specialist, how large the sample can be at the maximum? Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's an uh, imaging time question, but uh, in our experiment would typically do square centimeters on a regular basis, but then thin sections, like 10 micron uh, sections, uh, and um, we most like to do good bigger. And, um, <clears throat> but that's sort of the scale of, of uh, things. So centimeters. Great. Um, thank you, Matt. I, I wanted to move on to another question from the audience, and this relates to data analysis, um, which is, are our current data analytics capabilities a bottleneck, or is the bottleneck still at technology development or optimization or data generation? Um, maybe I'll forward this question to Linda to attempt first, and then we can have the rest of the panels. Oh, Linda says, I'm sorry to have lost audio. While we are working on audio, oh, she might be coming back on. So while we're waiting for Linda to come back on, um, would um, Hiroki or Ali take this question? So data analysis, at least for um, imaging data, is clearly, of course, a uh, problem. Hero gave some clear numbers of terabytes and petabytes. And there is, um, you know, it's traditional methods is not going to work easily. So using image J filters, Imari segment, that these are all unreliable. And I see only one way out from this is the machine learning, um, deep learning, and uh, because they are quite scalable, high performance. But of course, the problem there will have is you need experts to develop that also. Second, usually these algorithms, you train them for one purpose, then you know it segment cell bodies, and now if the cell body is a bit different, the performance will be lower, and then you need to retrain them. But we need also some kind of uh, background offers, I think, like, um, Software companies who are doing this kind of things, like Imaris, are with, they should integrate. I think this kind of um, softwares that you can put your data, and there is a backbone deep learning algorithm. You can train them with your samples. It would be four x, ten x different because for each person, you do like a few hours of training, then it learns how to do it, then it moves to analysis. So I mean, uh, that would be an ideal solution if uh, a commercial company do that. Otherwise, the labs would do that. For, you know, we do it but for our algorithms to use. We use a lot of deep learning, and all of them are available at GitHub and so on. But then you need still a deep learning expert, someone who can understand these codes and runs relative. Otherwise, there is no graphical user interface. You can just go and click and then train your algorithm. But that's clearly needed, and hopefully commercial solutions will come. Maybe your uh, cloud uh, thing going to do that. Yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah, you're right. So, uh, how to say, uh, data analysis is a kind of a bottleneck 
like uh, many other uh, neuroscience, how to say, uh, research. So once you have a data, uh, you, know, you need another couple of months to analyze the data. That's the usual things. And then to speed up such kind of a process, we are currently uh, uh, launching the, some kind of commercially available service, uh, which is called the Cubic Cloud Service. And then you can uh, put your data onto the cloud, like uh, Amazon you know, AWS-based service. So you don't have to, how to say, uh, hire the uh, computational bio computational or person in your lab. You just, how to say, put the data onto the uh, uh, cloud service and then analyze your data. Okay? So uh, at the moment, all the resolution data can be analyzed through the cloud. And the challenging thing, challenging thing is terabyte, terabyte data. So usually that data is a little bit difficult to analyze through the, uh, how to say, commercially uh, service. But uh, in the future, if the, uh, we can develop the uh, uh, efficient image uh, storage, uh, or analysis uh, kind of an algorithm, we can we can put them into the uh, cloud-based service and then uh, allow the user to analyze their own terabyte or even petabyte data. But that's the future. So currently, gigabyte data would be a, a good target. Hiro, um, how will you have compatibility with the bioimage archive resource at EBI, and um, what are the capabilities of that? Or yeah. So or yeah. So so uh, so we are focusing on the uh, kind of organ level analysis, you know, because for for the image analysis, comparison between different lab is quite important, right? So for that purpose, one, you know, we first develop the atlas, which can work as a kind of a reference uh, data, and then you can map onto the atlas your data. Uh, and then analyze. And then once you register your data onto the same address, you can compare them with the other lab's data. That's the key. And then, so we don't want to compete with other, you know, or image analysis service, but uh, we just focusing on the organ level data. Which, is because, you know, that such kind of a data is quite new. And then with uh, tissue clearing and also light sheet, advanced light sheet microscopy. It, yeah. This sort of brings up the general question of as, as um, different labs, maybe who aren't, let's say, pioneers and have deep expertise, start using the Visium platform. How are they to publish their data sets to be, you know, sort of cross usable and, and right. um, you know, kind of integratable over multiple data sets? Right. So, and benefit from the reference frameworks right. that you're, you're talking right. about. Right. Well. Yeah. So maybe, uh, you know, some service may be commercial service, and then some database would be a publicly, public, uh, how to say, the database supported by government or international effort. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in the genome science, uh, so there are, uh, how to say, GenBank, uh, right? So, and then you can submit uh, your data on GenBank. And then, so similar, uh, how to say, public, uh, government-funded uh, database would be uh, needed for this, uh, how to say, uh, uh, for these communities. So, and then uh, based on that, you know, some commercially commercial service would be uh, would be enhanced would be enhancing the user experience. I'm expecting such kind of a you know public-private interactions. Thank you, Hiroki. I first forwarded this question or directed the question to Linda when she had um, audio struggles. Uh, she's back on. No? Oh, okay. So we might have. I understood. Okay. That's, um, that's not a problem. So perhaps we could um, move on to the next. Uh, she's here. She's just muted. Um, Linda, are you able to unmute? And Still muted. But I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. I'm so, so sorry. My I'm on my phone. <laughs> my computer uh, has has crashed. Uh, okay. No, the, the question originally was directed to you on the 
um, whether our current data analytics capabilities is a bottleneck at the moment or is the bottleneck still at the technology development and data generation uh, side of things. And I was hoping that you might say a few words on that. Um, actually, uh, I could say a few words, but I'm not uh, an expert in this area. Um, but I, I am interested to understand how how the data um, is going to be integrated between different groups. So I noticed different people using different platforms for um, their data analysis, and uh, I wondered if there's any um, any effort to kind of harmonise that between different groups at the moment. Um, I think that quite, that was sort of partly addressed a bit earlier um, by I'm the sorry. Is it? Um, but maybe um, Bruce, who asked the question, could just briefly recap um, some of the points made. Um, well, there were some brilliant points made, and um, it'll be fun to go back in the video and see that, which I, I don't think I could do justice to. But but the, some of the ideas were on establishing a reference framework, um, mapping to that. Um, Matt's pointed out um, that. You know that this kind of emerging realization that as as and particularly in the brain as the animals or as we age and, and mature that there's some intricacies that seem not to be comparable between from one individual to another, and so right. I'm, I'm wondering if that you know how how are we going to see disease in that context if there's so much individuation in post um, um, you know postnatal maturation and uh, of, of so. I think that's um, that's one of the really exciting uh, parts of this type of work, though. So I wasn't meaning that there has to be necessarily a reference, you know, only you know one one type of um, reference for all brains. Um, it's more um, being able to compare those brains across a similar platform with data coming in from different labs across different developmental stages, different um, life, um, lifetime stages, and, um, and also being able to integrate that data with um, MRI data perhaps as well. Um, and, you know, one could see, I'm sorry if you covered this already when I was um, out of the picture, but um, one could see an opportunity for uh, sort of live imaging with MRI, maybe functional MRI, and uh, diffusion imaging, and then clearing the brain, the very same brain, um, and, uh, and, and using different antibodies on that and being able to integrate that data all the way from um, cleared brains uh, to uh, also have some spatial functional data, functional MRI data on that. Um, Sorry, go on, Linda. Uh, so um, certainly in the in the International Brain Initiative, uh, we have a data standards and sharing working group that is working on integrating histological data with MRI data currently, and there's some fantastic platforms in Europe. The, the Human uh, Brain Project in Europe has has platforms as well as the Japan Brain Minds Initiative as well. Um, and I think this is sort of the next step if we could try to think about for, for at least for brain data, integrating those together would be fantastic. I guess it comes to the wish list that most people have in terms of multi-omics and also in terms of incorporating some of the more, um, you know, parallel um, approaches, histology, morphology, imaging, and ultimately also function. So and the genomics. Yeah, and I, would, I, I thought this would be a good time to kind of move on to the next question. And this is really bringing the two fields of, um, you know, um, light sheet microscopy, tissue clearing, and the spatial genomics. Uh, could tissue clearing method be combined with in situ sequencing methods? Um, and I think I know at least Alan and Max are sort of working on it uh, together. So maybe. Alan can start off followed by Matt. 
Yeah, I mean, we discussed it a little bit before. What, what we know now is for sure, like mRNA with uh, most tissue clearing technique, they're still preserved. So, so that's something that is good. We know at least uh, uh, you can do RNA scope on and combine it with 3D clearing on not on on brains or mass brains. So it's also something that is working. Now, can we do 100 or 200 probes uh, on a single uh, sample? Um, they're not there yet. Uh, I don't think anybody is. Um, but at least, I mean, the, so there's room for improvement. <laughs> but it should be, I think, at the end, it should be feasible. It might be difficult also considering the complexity of um, even on sections of mapping in your cells with in-situ sequencing, dots, etc. When it's going to be a whole mouse brain, it might be, get very, very complex to identify single cells uh, in 3D. Um, so again, there would be a need for development of a uh, good algorithm to, to map and to, to do the alignment. It's already complex in 2D, I think, uh, mass can tell. I think in 3D, it could be, uh, very, very complex. But, but at least it, it should, I mean, it's feasible and it should be, uh, there's a room for improvement for sure. Yeah. So, so the, what we're going to do initially is to uh, section, uh, whole imaged organs and then um, uh, sort of comprehensive profiling of one on plane of, of, it, of it. And, and I can't see the problem with that that should really best work and uh, the, the experiments are I think underway now in, in the lab so we've got the we had house brains from Hill also we're, we're running the, the experiments to talk. Now, I, I, I think that will work beautifully. And it should even maybe work a little bit better on cleared uh, tissue than uncleared tissue. I'm quite optimistic. And then uh, the approach we're thinking is, is then just to you know start with thin sections and then do thicker and thicker sections. And at some point, we need to change imaging and reality using standard uh, epifresh microscopy. We would need to go focal. Uh, high throughput or focal, and, and then I think at some point we will need to step into light sheet uh, imaging. Um, and then, at, yeah, we'll just see how deep we can go with the, these uh, molecular reactions because it's uh, doing hundreds of, of genes, then, then you have to do sequential uh, staining and imaging, uh, the combinatorial or non combinatorial. Um, which means that there will, of course, be lots of images, there will be a lot of data. In our 2D imaging experiments, we, we generate terabits of data per square centimeter, and, and so it, you know, it would go computationally more heavy. I think actually, um, assignment of reads to cells will be easier in 3D than 2D. Uh, I think that there are many, you know, I think that's, it's, it's just, um, it is, I don't see a conceptual problem. I, I think it's just to, you just have to start generating the data and learn uh, how to do it properly. Well, sounds very exciting um, advances to look forward to. Um, you know, in increasing the intricacies of um, spatial genomics and tissue clearing. Um, there's another question on which comes uh, under ethical issues. Uh, with regards to human brain transparency, uh, do we have the kind of um, have we addressed all of the ethical issues to create you know transparent human brains for studies? Uh, and um, I wondered what the panel would have uh, would, would like to sort of say with regards to that. And so I, I can answer for the uh, human brain. I must go ahead. No, it was just to say, like, um, to talk about the human brain and also generally, you know, tissue clearing of um, adult organs, um, per se. Um, in, in, in human, I think human organ clearing, uh, per, you know, ethicals is the easiest to get. Uh, usually, these people, they give their consent to donate their bodies to science. When they sign this, no one can disagree. And this is also standard procedure in in medicine, either themselves or someone very close to them can do that. Of course, it's more problem with always with the animals. So I see the problem. 
the size, you know, maybe Hero has more problems with normal say than and other things. But at human ethical, I think there's no no problem because this is just anyway, it's dead body. Well, you know, we just use it because they are uh, um, donated for the science. Can I make a comment? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think that, um, could I just clarify maybe the question is not just about um, regulation of ethics, but a more um, deeper question about neuroethics, which is uh, more about um, human beings as as entities and that, that they're you know, if we do find that there are quite different um, structurally between individuals, um, is this, you know, have we thought about the ethical implications of um, what we might find in terms of, you know, details, structure? For example, um, number of synapses in one, um, one race of people versus another race of people. Or, uh, or in, um, you know, obviously there would be differences across different ages, but, uh, there's, there may be new information that we might discover about the human brain that might lead to discrimination or, um, you know, a deeper understanding, but perhaps, uh, addressing some neuroethical issues is important as we do this work. Yes, I will shortly continue, Linda. I thought all this, maybe they're asking that, but I guess I didn't answer in that regard because we are, I guess, far away from that point. I mean, we are nowhere now having synaptic information all brain. So that is clearly a um, far-fetched idea, but we have to start thinking, you're right. There will be potentially um, some, some things to consider, how to reveal this data, how to use this data, the same with human genomics data. I guess we will just simply take some of these uh, common applications that are developed for genomics data and apply there for the mapping data. So recently, I had a compass. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, recently, yeah. So recently, I had a how to say contact by the forensic scientist. Uh, and then who are interested in the cause of the suicide or cause of the uh, infant sudden death. And that they are uh, interested in the, how to say, brain activities, which is usually difficult to investigate. But the, by using tissue clearing and also or brain profiling, so you can, how to say, access to the, uh, uh, you know, such kind of data. And then, of course, you know, all motivation behind is to prevent the suicide or uh, sudden death of the infant. But uh, I agree, you know, transparency of the uh, someone's brain is uh, a little bit, you know, uh, you should be very careful about that. So uh, currently, as, as Ali said, uh, currently we are in the kind of a premature uh, to, uh, how to say, uh, to look at the uh, very detailed uh, content of the thinking, but uh, uh, we only focusing on, we are only, how to say, identify, we can only identify the, some kind of uh, uh, rough activity of the brain, which is useful for the identification of the cause of this. But, uh, but uh, we should be very careful. And I agree to start a discussion about the such kind of ethical issues. Just the only thing I wanted to add is that and also Linda is a uh, nose obviously. So there are kids uh, that have like corpus callosum malformation. And, and now uh, people are starting to use like in utero imaging using diffusion tensor imaging to see like callosal kind of defect. And then based on what they see using DTI, which is not very precise, I must say, uh, they say, okay, look, we think that based on our experience, your, your kid might either not be viable or have severe brain deficits. And they might recommend eventually, if it's possible in the country, to, to stop the pregnancy. And, and that's where also the 3D will be very useful because then, uh, we can like combine and uh, like in vivo imaging of brain defect to like real images and then be more precise and then feed back to the DTI people and say they have a bit of a diagnostic. But I think that type of things will be very useful. Like, can we better understand like, uh, brain disorders? And, and can we better interpret the, uh, the image data, like in adult or in during development? 
So, so it will be, I think, very uh, so positive to combine the, the, the techniques. So it, it will have some ethical uh, issues at some point. It sounds like it would be very important to make sure that these ethical kind of considerations move in parallel with the technology uh, data generation and applications of these methods. And that's something that we should take note and, and ensure that it happens uh, throughout this research process. Certainly with, um, with uh, neuroethics, uh, we have an established uh, neuroethics working group within the International Brain Initiative, and maybe we can collaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that sounds like a very um, approach to go through. Um, I'm uh, aware that we've only got five more minutes left, so there's one final question, and it's a question on how feasible will it be for other researchers to use the open source cloud-based analysis platform uh, that, um, you know, that has that have been described, uh, including one that you will keep mentioned. Yeah. So, so I think you know, or some some activity or service it would be should be uh, open, and then some sh um, activity would be uh, private because you know you can expect uh, how to say a uh, good user experience can be coming from the commercial commercial company. So, or but you know, or at the same time. Um, you know, everybody interested in the, how to say, detailed data. So viewing might be free, and then uploading or analyzing data would be, uh, how to say, be paid for the maintenance of the, uh, how to say, cloud. So therefore, I, uh, I would like to uh, suggest, you know, some kind of, you know, private, public, kind of a hybrid model would be a, uh, uh, a good model for the sustainability of uh, this community. Ali, have you got any comments on, you know, because with regards to um, sharing or availability of uh, cloud-based platforms for the broader research community? This is <clears throat> tough um, in, in a way that actually I'm not really sure if we are even there technologically. For example, if we generate, I don't know, 100 or 500 terabytes of data, how are we going to upload to where? I mean, my computer would take, I don't know, maybe half year to upload this data. And if it doesn't collapse in between, it will. So basically, this is technically almost impossible how to do that. I guess we have to solve this problem first. How different in different parts of the world this generated data can go to cloud? I don't have a solution. Hero is trying to develop, but I would be a bit uh, um, skeptical that it's going to just work. Um, I hope that we can get significant help from people who are doing big companies uh, like uh, Facebook, Google, who are dealing all with this large data. They should, if without their help, I don't see that we can do this easily. And, you know, at some point, we're starting to generate the carbon dioxide footprint, I think, uh, for all this data. I, I agree. I think the environmental impact uh, must parallel the kind of ethical concerns that we've talked yeah. about in the last question. Um, Bruce, do you want to chime in any uh, on, on the kind of like um, availability of cloud resources for data analysis for the broader community? Uh, I agree with Ali. I just uh, myself sent a uh, eight terabyte hard drive to a collaborator to get the data because there's just no chance that we we're going to transfer it. But you know, I think that as as we get to smarter data representations, uh, wavelets, and you know, kind of vector based methods, that that this stuff is going to compress. And then the problems that people really need to solve, you know, like like Linda was was addressing, um, you know, and Matt's were addressing, um, what What's the, the the population that's present? How what are their underlying genomic um, programs? How do we do networks between us? How do we understand the you know, the impact of, of disease and what's going on with development to, in order to form these beautiful structures? And there's I think we're going to be able to get down to to concise data bits that that people can use in their analyses and their thinkings to generate hypotheses. And I think that's the biggest challenge is to turn these you know. It's very rich data into those bits that where we can do reasoning and hypothesis generation. No, that's brilliant. Um, in in we've run out of all the questions, so we've we've done well in time. 
Uh, you know, I think there are some closing slides, Christine, or do I? Yep, I'm going to share them. For those of, yeah, if anybody else wants to vote last time, please do so, but then the closing slides should come up in a minute. Um, so once again, uh, many thanks to our speakers, panelists, and all of you who have attended the seminar. The first slide is thanking everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Human Cell Atlas Developmental Spatial Cell Mapping Seminar. Uh, this one was particularly for the Asia and Australia um, region. Uh, special thanks to the HCA Developmental Program Committee, um, Bruce, uh, who's here today, Gary Vader, Alan, myself, Stanley Nelson, Avi Regev, Ian Taylor, and Sarah Teichman, and also the HCA Executive Office, Christine Schrank, Tracy Andrew, and Scott Sasson, who helped us with the uh, audio visuals last time. And I think it's Brian today who helped us. Thank you very much to um, Max, Ali, uh, Hiroki, um, Alan, and I think it's Linda Richards who was here today, along with Bruce, uh, for being on the panel, uh, for sparing the time, particularly for those who've come here twice, uh, presenting and being on the panel. It's been really great. I'm really, really pleased to have had all your input and everyone's questions. Thank you. <laughs>